When I approach a student's paper to grade, the first thing I do is I read the whole thing all the way through. Um, I just want to get kind of a holistic idea of what's there. Because I find that one of the problems I have is that I expect information to be in what I would consider a logical place because I've been writing for a long time. And I find that as I start commenting, then I'll read on and find that actually they did include that information, it's just later on. So I feel kind of like I'm interrupting the student's process of getting to where they want to go. Uh, when I generally grade, I like to read over the entire assignment first and then go back through it and put in some small comments and then hit preview so I can see all of the red that I put in and see if it's too much or if it's too little if I'm going to intimidate the student. And then I'll read back through those comments and put a general head note at the top. And I always put it at the top so that way they're more inclined to read it because I think if it's at the bottom and there is all that red throughout it, they're going to get discouraged. You know, I'm still, I'm still kind of figuring it out. Usually I read the paper before I start commenting on it. I read it once and then I go in and I start putting in little comments and ever since we've been grading the drafts I've been making a really big effort to put a holistic comment in the end. You know, talking about how they did overall, which I hadn't been doing before that and I probably should have. What I like to do when I'm grading is have paper next to me, uh, which may go against the whole saving paper through an online grading system, but I like to take notes on uh, what I'm grading so that I can use those for my overall comment. What I try to do first off is uh, read the whole document or essay before I <laughs> assign a grade. But I tend to grade like more holistically, you know what I mean? Um, so that's sort of kind of drives what I'm doing, sort of like how they get their point across just in a general sense. I used to read papers through before I started making comments, but I stopped because it took too long. Yeah. I know that's probably not a good thing, but I, I don't like to take a long time grading them. How do you balance encouragement and remediation? You know, I always, I try to stay positive and be polite, you know. My husband always talks about the golden rule of writing, which is, well, the golden rule for everything, um, treat others the way that you would want to be treated. So we talk about that a lot, um, he and I, how that pertains to grading. Um, and so basically, I guess when I go through freshman essays, I just think about what sorts of comments would be useful for me if I was writing the essay, um, and what kinds of comments would be offensive to me if I was getting back the essay. And that's another thing I do is I always, I always start it with a positive, so they feel good about themselves before I tear them down. I'm kind of a hard grader, mm -hmm. I, I admit that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't really usually say anything good unless the student does something good. And I would say, good point, well, you, you've done this well, you have a foundation, you have a background for what you need to do, but, yeah, I'm not usually a cheerleader. Also, I try to encourage, I say, try to say one nice thing <laughs> for each paper, uh, even though it's really hard. How do you balance questions and comments? I give them prompts to develop the point further, as in, okay, well, maybe you should look at this in more detail. Um, is the author trying to do X, Y, or Z? Um, and then I do that for every paragraph, unless it's repetitive and they're doing the same thing over and over, in which case I say, well, this is kind of redundant, you're doing this, you know, you already did this, uh, see above for, you know, commentary on that specific issue. And just basically try to give them questions, because I feel like if I just tell them what to do or what they're doing wrong, it's too limiting, and it's taking the agency away from them to explore. You can write as well as you spoke at your brilliant best when you were five years old. If you find a voice that rings true and you learn to record the surprises of the world faithfully. Ken McRory. But then I still try and guide them with the questions. Like I'll ask three questions and hopefully they'll pick the right one mm -hmm. <laughs> so that they actually know what they're doing as opposed to, you know, randomly guessing and then doing the wrong thing anyway. But for things like using using second person, I generally say don't use second person. You know, it's not usually appropriate for formal for formal writing. That I'm allowing the student to be a little bit vague in general and using their own 
vocabulary because they're still struggling with these concepts and how to organize and I don't want to take that experience away from them and say you're not doing this right I don't want to moralize as much as I want to give them the space to say okay you did some things well you found your own voice but if you want to make uh, make this fit this rhetorical genre a little bit better here's some questions that you could ask yourself to explore and then making these good ideas better packaged I, I like to use a lot of questions uh, to get them to think without sort of telling them what I think they should be thinking. One thing that I do notice I tend to do, and I probably shouldn't do this, is, you know, if, if there's a point where I think the student's trying to write something and I don't quite understand what he's saying, or I think I understand what he's saying, but I think he's just wrong, sometimes I comment on it and I ask him, you know, a question like, did you mean this? And usually, this is what I think the right answer is. And sometimes then I'll, you know, I have a conversation in my head with the student because I don't get to interact with them. You know, I'm thinking, well, the student might answer me like this, and so I'll write some other comments. I'm like, you might be thinking this in response to my question, but then think of this, and it, <laughs> it gets very convoluted. Because that's a hard balance to take between pointing at it and saying, fix this, and not telling them how to fix it, but then if you tell them how to fix it, then uh, that's not very good either. So kind of trying to find that happy balance of these are the things that you're doing well, this is what you should continue to do, um, and then how about taking another look at these, um, bringing them back to their overall purpose, and, and, and writing to them what I would like to receive on my papers that I write. And I, I do try to look for original thought, too. Um, sometimes you read so many of the things, and so many of the freshmen have the same types of perspectives on things. You know, they're all saying the same thing. And that gets boring. And so if somebody, even if the paper's bad, or somebody says something different than other people are saying, I'd be like, oh, this is good. Look into this some more. And the keys to their development as writers often lie hidden in the very features of their writing that English teachers have been trained to brush aside with a marginal code letter or a scribbled injunction to proofread. Such strategies ram at the doors of their incompetence while the keys that would open them lie in view. Mina Shaughnessy. There, they are questions that are uh, intended to get them to question the kind of assertions that they're making and maybe lead them in a different direction that would in most cases be more logical or get them to see that something is more complicated than they have originally identified it as. Um, I usually try and put questions in into the document right after a statement that is, it, they may refer to a whole paragraph, but I try to focus them in on a statement that might be especially problematic or uh, that just needs a lot of thought revision. The speaker or writer wants to say what he has to say with as little energy as possible, and the listener or reader wants to understand with as little energy as possible. I think, I think that to have comments that would give them ownership or remind them of their own ownership of the essay would be the kind of comment I'm looking for. Also, have, telling them to revise their work before, read it, you know, at least one time before they submit because there are oftentimes so many obvious uh, grammatical or just overuse of words in a sentence <laughs> that it's not that their ideas are necessarily so bad it's that they're not being able to communicate them in a way that's effective so I tried to uh, point out in a couple different sentences how they could uh, get them more concise for clarity and I think that in a lot of cases they would be able to see their own argument better if their sentences weren't so confusing and see where they need to revise in terms of content and structure if their sentence levels ideas were more clear. A lot of times I tell them to proofread because a lot of the errors that they have is because they don't and I think that helps on every level of revising and yeah. editing. But mostly I don't focus on grammar and more content oriented in my commentary. How important is grammar? I don't really like 
grammar. Uh, I don't like looking for grammar. Uh, when I'm grading, I'm trying to, I'm grading the ideas. Um, if the sentences are clear in their meaning, um, if it's just completely in, unintelligible, then I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment about that. But usually I try to stay away from, you know, uh, you have a comma splice here, you miss an apostrophe. If it's just blatantly obvious, then yeah, I'll point it out, but I don't really focus on that. The formal study of grammar improved neither writing quality nor control over surface correctness. Patrick Hartwell. That's always something that I suggest is to go back and try and make corrections, not only with uh, grammatical errors and typos, but uh, in, the, in their critical thinking. Also, I think this composition class should be about critical thinking. And that's what, what writing should be about. It should be questioning ideas coming up with your own responses to those ideas and putting it together in a, a clear sounding way. The, the thing that I focus on most is probably their critical thinking and whether or not they're being accurate with their arguments and whether or not they're contradicting themselves in their paper. Uh, I come across a few that make an argument at the beginning and then work it around and somehow get turned around and argue the opposite by the end. Um, one thing that I really try to encourage, and it's weird, I, I don't know if it's ever uh, been successful, but it's something that I work for, it's just encouraging thinking. Like, uh, if I see a student has written something, and you can tell that there is a thought process that sort of shows up through the paper, um, that's something I work to encourage, and, and that's where a lot of my comments are focused on that, you know, to say, I can see your logic, or sometimes I can't see your logic, but I can understand there's an argument here, and I kind of see it developing. So that, that's where, like, a lot of my holistic comments, uh, that's the focus of those. Results. Uh, overall, the graders I interviewed graded holistically. They formulated guiding questions instead of directives for the students, and they focused on critical thinking over grammar. Further research is needed to determine the causes of these emphases. They could result from pedagogic philosophies embedded in 1301 meetings, peer influence, 5060 course readings and discussions, convenience and stress, or maybe some other causes. Further research still is needed to determine the impact of holistic, question-driven, critical thinking-centered comments on students.